Konnichiwa, my name is Logan Charles Luna, and this is going to be my review for book three of The Legend of Korra, Change. The book starts off with Korra dealing with the aftermath of opening the spirit portals. Uh, first, Republic City, a large portion of it gets taken over by spirit vines and spirits themselves. They claim it to be their territory now. It upsets a lot of people in Republic City, and a startling reveal is shown when people are starting to get airbending. Now, it kind of... It brings a lot of questions to how bending works. Uh, first off, if bending is uh, just genetic, I don't think just attacking the air nomads would have taken air bending away from the world anyway. And what I mean is they attack the air nomads, but they also attack the water tribe and the earth kingdom. And from what you see in Avatar The Last Airbender, not all airbenders were really that pacifist. Uh, they weren't really against violence. They would fight. They would put up a fight against the firebenders. And especially what you see later on, some of the techniques in Book 3, you could tell, well, they could probably beat the firebenders. But, you know, it was plot convenient in Avatar The Last Airbender for Aang to be the last airbender. And... Now we move on to Korra wanting to reunite the Air Nomads and the Air Nation with Tenzin. Also, she gets kicked out of Republic City. Like, she gets banned from Republic City. So, essentially, Korra's homeless. And now the antagonist gets introduced into Book 3, Zaheer. Zaheer is kind of a like fanboy for airbenders one in particular the guru lahima and zahir discovers that he has now been gifted airbending so it's a good thing he studied airbending and if zahir wasn't part of this uh terrorist organization the red lotus i feel like he was definitely interested in becoming an air acolyte which is the people who love airbending and they wish they could have been airbenders. However, you know, it just didn't work out for them because airbenders didn't exist unless you were directly related to the last airbender, Aang. And now, ironically, Boomy, who had no bending, uh, he's one of Aang's sons, now he was gifted airbending and he feels... He has mixed feelings about it, definitely, for sure. He finally feels like he's able to stand up next to his brother and sister, who were benders since birth. But Bumi also feels like there's an unrealistic expectation for him to catch up to where Tenzin is at, yet alone to catch up to where Aang was. And he feels like, although now he can understand airbending, he doesn't really understand how to be an airbender or he hasn't gotten a closer connection to his father and that gets brought up a lot in book three where pretty much the only good parent any of these uh descendants have and that includes the Beifong family looks like the only good parent out of team avatar was katara and you can definitely tell because Kaya doesn't have that many hangups about her dad because Kaya was more connected to her mother anyway. And Bumi definitely had the black sheep status of the siblings. Bumi was definitely an afterthought after Tenzin discovered his airbending and Aang just completely focused on Tenzin and in many ways pushed Bumi away. Aang is not the best avatar, 
and definitely not the best father, but that goes back to Aang's upbringing. He was an air nomad. They didn't have parents. He was basically a free range kid who lived in a hippie commune. So he doesn't know how to be a parent because he doesn't know what a parent is. Throughout the whole series, they keep saying, oh, in the original one, Avatar The Last Airbender, they keep comparing Katara to a mom. But Aang doesn't really see her that way. One, he's got a huge crush on her. But two, he doesn't know what a mom is. That's why it kind of feels so painful because Aang doesn't understand the traditional roles of parents and children. But he did have a very father-son connection to Monkiatsu. And that's why in the original series he has that big breakdown in season one. When he realizes that everyone he knew is gone. But he essentially also lost his father. Now Tenzin and Korra's journey to round up all the airbenders. It has a very bad start. No one really wants to give up their life and worldly possessions to be an air nomad because they weren't brought into or born into this air nation. They were already people with lives of their own. So taking them away from that was a real culture shock and they resisted, they refused. They finally get someone to join in and rebuilding the air nation and it's Kai. He's a kid who is an orphan, and it reminds Mako a lot of him. So Mako is really resistant and hesitant, which begs the question, Mako still is hung up about all the things he had to do to survive when they were orphans and when they lived in Republic City as young boys. Bullen has definitely moved on from that, and he believes if we could change, so can Kai. And Bolin actually wants to take Kai in as a younger brother. And Mako's very hesitant because, yet again, Kai has a lot of the traits that younger Mako had when he was a kid growing up on the streets. Now we move over to Zaheer. Throughout the first five episodes, Zaheer is busting out all of his friends from the Red Lotus. He busts out the Lava Bender. He busts out the Water Whip Girl. And finally, he's going to bust out his tall girlfriend who does combustion bending, Plea, from the ice prison of the Northern Water Tribe. This is our introduction to Old Man Zuko. And Old Man Zuko ain't having none of it. So he takes Korra's dad and the new leaders of the Northern Water Tribe, Ask, Eska, and Desna to the secret ice prison so that they can prevent Zaheer and his crew from busting Plea out. They fail. Zuko's dragon. This season, it's introduced that Zuko has a dragon now. And he's like um, his grandfather, Avatar Roku. And he's sick and badass old man Zuko. And his dragon gets attacked repeatedly throughout this season. Like, Zuko's dragon just can't catch a break in this season. He keeps getting hit by attacks, by rocks. And now, there's a confrontation in Bossing Se between Korra and the Earth Queen. The Earth Queen is definitely more of a tyrannical, childish, spoiled dictator. And Mako and Bolin meet their family. They also realize that they didn't know that Bolin and Mako's parents died. So they kind of have to break that to them. The family takes it in stride somehow because although they've lost a family member and his spouse, they do have Mako and Bolin back and they get to reconnect with them. Korra does a few errands for the Earth Queen. She realizes the Earth Queen's just uh, pushing her along and is trying to her best to keep her from realizing that there's a secret airbending army. But pretty much everyone in Bossing Se knows that there's a secret airbending army. 
and they bust out the airbenders. The airbenders decide we'd rather be air nomads than soldiers for this tyrannical ruler. They join Tenzin, and then Korra gets split off where she's joined by Chief Beifong. Lin and Korra then take a trip to meet a new airbender that's in a city that was built by Lin's sister, and Lin has a lot of unresolved issues with her sister. This gets brought up in a series of episodes where Lin has to deal with her, not only her past and the past of her sister, but the actions of Toph. And again, while Aang never had parents, he had no resource, he had nothing to pull on from experience in raising his kids, so he just really messed up. Toph never wanted to be that strict parent. She didn't want to be overbearing or overprotective like her parents was, so she gave her kids too much freedom. So much so that her youngest daughter became a criminal. Like she was a getaway driver for this gang. And now Lynn it gets into detail about why the relationship is so strange. It's because Lynn's sister gave her the scars on her face. So yeah, she isn't going to let that one go. When she finally does and they reconnect, it's not a full on sisterly embrace or an understanding. It's trying. Because Lynn is putting her best foot forward, but she also wants it to be let known that it's going to take a lot to rebuild that relationship that they had. And they're sort of establishing they never really had that great of a relationship to begin with. Now, Korra gets apprehended by Zaheer and the Red Lotus while they're in this city. Obviously, someone let them in because the city is touted to be the best and most secure city in all the world. And Zalfu being infiltrated really pushed people back. Like, that never happens. So after they deal with the Red Lotus, they start to investigate who let them in. They later find out that an advisor for Zhao Fu betrayed them, and he was a member of the Red Lotus the whole time. They try and track him down, but that only leads them into getting split off again. Mok Mako and Bolin get captured by the Red Lotus, and they're used as hostages, leverage, what have you. And Asami and Korra actually get kidnapped by the Earth Queen. Asami and Korra bust out. However, on the airship, they bring the airship down and crash in the middle of the desert. Meanwhile, Mako and Bolin are trying to get information from the Red Lotus as to why they're trying to capture Korra and what their whole goal is so that they can stop him. Bolin has a somewhat uh, mentor relationship with the Lava Bender. Because the Lava Bender sees a lot of his younger self in Bolin. And Bolin is really interested in how you even become a Lava Bender. It's a very rare skill that he had no idea existed until they started fighting the Red Lotus. And now Korra helps Asami and the crew escape the desert. They make it back into town. And by the time they make it back into town, Zaheer and the Red Lotus take Mako and Bolin to the Earth Kingdom. And Zaheer's basically, he finds out that Korra escapes the clutches of the Earth Queen. So he's done playing around. And he moves into his end game. And he kills the Earth Queen in a brutal fashion. He takes the air out of her body. And she suffocates to death. Yeah, uh, Guru Lahima... <laughs> I don't know what like his problems were like so Guru Lahima is kind of touted off as a very like important figure in airbending culture that lived like thousands of years ago but he was kind of a extremist which is why Zaheer is drawn to him and so 
now with the Earth Queen dead, the Earth Kingdom is just falling apart. Especially Ba Sing Se, there are riots, looting, and it's part of Zaheer's plan to bring chaos to the world in order to restore balance and bring forth the natural order, which is everyone for themselves. This later leads on to Korra being baited into a trap that's set by Zaheer. Zaheer captures the entire air nation at the air temple where they were staying. Korra feels like the only way to really win is to turn herself in and then have the team help her out. Um, everything goes wrong. So initially when Team Avatar goes to pick up Tenzin and the other airbenders, it was a trap. The airbenders were moved to another location and they are only able to rescue Tenzin. Bolin is put into a situation where it's do or die, so if they're going to die anyway, he might as well give it a shot. And Bolin tries lava bending and he successfully blocks a wall of lava from hitting them. Bolin is now a lava bender, which just really ups his character development, his worth to the team, his bending ability in general. And Bolin is definitely fan favorite character and my, like, he's really up there. The only character I love more than Bolin is Korra. And now we get to Korra. So there's an epic fight between uh, Plea going up against Korra's dad and the Beifong sisters, Lin and Sue. So now Lin and Sue have to take out Plea. They do this by Lin providing a distraction. Meanwhile, Sue takes off her armor, metal bends it around Plea's face as she's about to do combustion bending, and Plea's head gets blown up. They blew up her head. Like another very crucial um, moment in the series and in the book. This now pushes Zaheer to reflect and think about the mantra of the Guru Lahima. Let go your earthly tether. Enter the void and become wind. So he does that exactly. He knocks out Korra. Then he jumps off this cliff. Zaheer flies. Now fully no longer having an earthly tether, he becomes wind and is essentially the greatest airbender there is at this time. So now it feels kind of hopeless because they have no idea where Korra's been taken to. They have no idea how to even stop Zaheer and the Red Lotus because, again, they don't know how many members of the Red Lotus there are. This organization could be far-reaching and very powerful in resources. Korra's father fell off the, hit, the cliff during his battle, and he was actually saved by Kuvira, who was a captain in the guards that Sue brought along from Zafu. And remember that name because in the most obvious she's the next bad guy spot, they zoom in on Kuvira's face where she has this kind of sinister grin after she introduces herself to Korra's father. And there's a zoom in on her face and somewhat eerie music playing like she's the next bad guy. So... Yeah, there's being subtle, and then there's just throwing it in your face. Now, Korra, she's in a very compromised position. She's chained up and can't really break free because there's so many metals that you just can't bend, even if you're a metal bender. So they just have her chained up in one of those. And their plan is to essentially poison Korra to weaken her to the state where she goes into the avatar state and then they can kill her and thus ending the cycle of the avatar and truly bringing chaos to the world where now no one can stop them from killing off the rest of the world leaders. Uh, Kai is brought back into the fold um, after like a little filler episode of the air nomads finding a herd of sky bison. 
uh, Kai and his Sky Bison lefty show up and they help Mako, Bolin, Asami, and Tenzin escape the lava covered air temple. Then he actually leads them to where the air nomads were taken. They have a plan set up to infiltrate and attack. Meanwhile, Janora with Sue's daughter Opal. Oh, the whole storyline with Opal and Bolin being interested in each other and trying to figure out how they can have a relationship with Bolin being this kind of vagabond and Opal obviously now becoming an air nomad and it was really cute like again more character progression and more development just overall for Bolin and yeah it's about time Bolin found someone because he's been kind of on the outskirts of this whole love triangle between Team Avatar all along. So, good for him. And now Jinora finds where they're keeping Korra. They find out what they're doing to Korra. And Korra is fighting and resisting the poison as much as she can. Which has really thrown off Zaheer and the Red Lotus. Because they kind of underestimated how strong Korra was. And... She starts hallucinating. Uh, Zaheer's face melts off and it turns into Amon's mask. And the metal, uh, the lava bender, his hair flips over and then he becomes her uncle, Unalak. And then the water bender becomes Vatu. And they all kind of berate Korra and just tell her to give up. Korra enters the Avatar state. But much to the surprise of the Red Lotus, it just made her more dangerous. <laughs> now that her body is in fight or flight mode and is full on going into the fight aspect of it, Korra is somewhat unstoppable at this moment. Like she is just stopping and countering everything that they throw at her. And the only reason. Zaheer gets an upper hand is because the poison actually starts taking full effect on Korra's body. Her mobility is limited. Her reflexes are almost non-existent and the pain is excruciating and really overwhelming her. But still, in this state, she was able to put up a fight against three of the most powerful benders you've ever seen in not just this series, but in The Last Airbender as well. Really cementing that Korra is on par with Kyoshi as being the most powerful avatar there has ever been. The Air Nomads come up with a plan led by Jinora to create this vortex to bring in Zaheer to disable his ability to fly. Korra then takes this moment to use the chain that's still wrapped around her arm to wrap it around Zaheer's leg and just bring him down. Sue and Lin stop Zaheer. They imprison him using their earth bending. Then they pull out the poison from Korra. Korra's alive. However, she's still very much feeling the effects of the poison. Much to the point where a few months later, Korra is in a wheelchair. She is disabled from the poison and her body is in shock. Much more than that, Korra looks devoid of all emotion. She's just empty inside. And now they kind of start to build on even more on the relationship of Korra and Asami. And Asami being there for Korra and being supportive, but... You can only do so much after someone experiences a very brutal, traumatic moment in their life. And Korra definitely feels like that is the most vulnerable she has ever been. She couldn't fight back. Her body gave up on her and now she's lost all the confidence she had. The young cocky, full of herself, fiery spirit avatar is no more. Like she's changed forever from this moment. 
And now, moving on, Tenzin assumes the responsibilities of the Avatar. He and the Air Nomads will bring peace to the Earth Kingdom and make sure the world doesn't fall apart while Korra recovers. Janora now is given her airbending tattoos as she is now an airbending master. The Vortex idea really pushed her over the edge in the eyes of Tenzin and although he does feel hesitant, his little girl is growing up and she's actually on par with him. So now for the first time in like 30, 40 years, there is now a new airbending master. The book ends on a very just tragic note with Cora being happy for her friend and realizing that now she might no longer be needed in this world. That maybe the world can go on without Cora and the Avatar. So now she's lost. And in the final shot of book three, it's a zoom in into Korra's face as a tear runs down. And she is, in this moment, completely and utterly defeated. Book three, Change, is without a doubt one of the strongest stories in the entire series of The Legend of Korra and in Avatar The Last Airbender as well. Book three is just really taking that step forward and cementing this story and Korra to be on their own. They broken apart from Avatar The Last Airbender. Definitely with all the murder, they've really broken apart from it. And now it's showing you the kind of the down effects of being the chosen one of being someone who the world relies on this was also touched upon on the final season of steven universe steven universe future but i feel the legend of korra addresses it in a better fashion because now it's not just the world doesn't need korra the world doesn't need the avatar it's korra no longer has a purpose korra feels lost and although later on the world shows that they actually really do need the Avatar to maintain balance and order in the world to stop people from taking over and just terrorizing the world. But at this moment, Korra is completely broken. And it's just one of the best storylines that the series does. So to end this review, I'm going to rate The Legend of Korra Book 3 Change 7 out of 7 stars. I rarely ever make anything 7 out of 7 stars. And mainly the perfect score means that for me, although there are problems in the season, I feel like it's hold up. It's the best season that they produce. And it really does bring change, not only to the world and to the series, but to Korra. Uh, thank you for watching this review. I know it's gone on longer than any of the other reviews I've done for this series. If you want video shoutouts at the end of this video, please do consider becoming a Patreon. Uh, link's going to be in the description of this video. Uh, follow my social media for more fan arts and artworks like this. Twitter and Instagram at LCLX25. This has been Logan Charles Luna and Sayonara.